did exactly the opposite of what we, we said we were going to do. But uh, how is that for a start? <laughs> look, look at me. I look like a shiny cue ball. Well, I'm not doing much better. <laughs> hello, hello. Well, uh, a little check in first and then we. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, well, yeah, you're recording, but we can always uh, edit that out. Yeah, I'll just, I, I, I like the beginnings because of their, um, their naturalness, mm -hmm. you know, mm. sort of like having what I think in the future is we, we already have the show and then there's sort of like other videos for the actual real audience that really like us and then they can see how we do it. The uh, behind the scenes. Exactly. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of people wanting that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, after, after listening to us an hour a week, <laughs> boy, we want to hear even more. <laughs> oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, some seminal points will be put across, I'm sure. Yes. Um, how are you doing? What's been going on? I'm doing good. I, I had another sort of exceptional spiritual experience on Saturday night. And it just, you know, it just, it's like one of those moments where everything you've ever gone through, the hell of the spiritual path in some ways becomes, okay, it was worth it. You know, it was just, <laughs> we, the, there was a reason. And and it kind of just took the edge off and it's, it's changed. It's, you know, it's a game changer. It's just, I'm just recalibrating around it, but it's, uh, you know, it's just progressive steps. And it was another step. I'd like to say it was this step, but it was a big enough step for me to, to kind of, you know, deal with the mundane side of things that sort of frustrate me. Yes. We really do need, um, I think as Terence McKenna really alluded to, we need regular psychedelicalizing of our soul really to take, um, take the edge off of the mundane and to inspire us again. Mm. Is when we're inspired, when you're in love, you know, you don't see all of the aggravating, annoying parts of the person. E Everything is buffeted by this inspiration. Mm. And that I think is the, the same with uh, psychedelicalizing the mind and the spirit is that then you can actually walk through life and, and be in love. Mm. And, uh, and I think it, it's net, I found it necessary to have rose colored glasses um, reinstilled back <laughs> on a regular basis because of that. Because, uh, man, life without inspiration, no matter how pleasurable the details may be, still comes up very stark. Yeah. 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 Well, that's, it's good to hear your words. It's good to... Uh, I'm really liking this. Like, I'm having this type of connection, I think, with five people now. And I've got two teams of four and a third one about to start. So I've got quite a locked in schedule now of media creation and it's um it's nice like it's it's everything i've wanted to do like the whole idea behind the very secret plan was the people who i was interacting with were in the show and i've always kind of <coughs> never been able to complete the cycle of going from the filming to the loading to the putting it up and distribution and now i'm filming and i'm loading it up I'm not looking at distribution or editing because that was the kind of a point where like on the filming side or the input, there's so I can create so much. There's so much that could be created, but then it's like, like fundamentally, really, I should just focus on one show once a week and do whatever, you know, make it it. But I want to create a media network and have a show that creates shows and support those that I think can hold their own show and do their own thing. And so you're such a, a person. Uh, and to me, this is like, a, again, a nucleus where at some point there's a large enough distribution network for us all where we kind of all leap together into 
uh, a much higher audience, but by that time we're ready for it. I don't think we're ready for it in terms of just our whole life and, and, and us, let's say, wanting to hone our skills in terms of being reporters or the story, right? I mean, it's, it's, it just doesn't come overnight and both of us have a lot on our plates in other worlds. And so this can only get so much of our time and attention. And, uh, but I think both of us are very into it because we see the larger need of the moment. Mm. You know? I, I see a great importance in um, media completion, completing some media, putting it out there. And what we're seeing is yes, um, to have polished product that fulfills one role but there is a lot of the social media food the bulk of it actually uh, now is in the moment it's more time timeliness mm. is actually more important than production quality mm. and um and you see a lot of of uh videos especially when it's talking about or it's talking you know it's actually people exchanging ideas and those are being thrown up uh quite quite quickly actually and so my my, my tendency is to hold back and to polish things um and yet um i am seeing that uh, there's a place for this mm. and um it's been a real week. It's been a real week of continued discussion with uh, different people online and, and, and really deciding how is it um, going to be that we have online forums, we have online conversations and disagreements and explorations and how does all this, our society operate online? And we've really stepped it up, you know, obviously throughout this quarantine. Mm. And so it's been, uh, I, I'm still in the midst of, of trying to get my footing and orientation on that. So I'm looking forward to throughout this conversation, kind of diving into that as well. Mm. Well, I, I think what I like about, you know, how we're discussing this, I mean, this is basically a conversation between me and you, right? And mm. I think when we're deep into that conversation and not really aware there's an audience we're trying to, to, to sort of please something, it's, it's more an, exp I, I like the idea of an exploration because it isn't just, you know, okay, the 5G connection and the pandemic rollout. There's so many other factors in terms of our social communication that are occurring that I don't see really played with by your normal you know, this is the event, this is what's occurring and da, 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 da. Like there's not a lot of, let's say, philosophical interpretation. There's not a lot of uh, seeing how the mind works and how brainwashing works and how that is going to affect how people see and understand what's occurring right now. And I think that we're sort of like a, a, a yogi and a wizard commentary, kind of like a, in a, like a basketball game where the, this, this thing is occurring. And we're the commentators and we're trying to bring attention to things other than you would normally see. Mm. So you might, you might be talking about, you know, the, the shooting or the rebounding or the, the way they're playing, but you may have insights into how one of the players thinks, or you may have insights into, you know, what basketball is, or you may have insights into, you know, uh, how our physical body, it, you know, is, is gains in health by playing basketball, whatever, whatever it is. But for us, we're commentating again, right, like the focus point, right, is what's the connection between the 5G rollout and this pandemic? So that's that current, that's that reference point. That's that, because we could talk about anything, really. And we are going to talk about, like, lots of things. <laughs> um, but I'm just wondering on your, you know, how, how, how do you hold that thread or how do you find, the, like, what's happened last week online in terms of, uh, that particular reference point, like for you, like, have you been tracking it as much? Uh, are you seeing anything new? Mm. I'm, I have, I've been looking more into the, um, 
epidemiologists and the statisticians, you know, the, the people that analyze statistics and looking at how many people are wanting or um, suggesting that um, the economy, life is starting to open back up. And we all know that there's an on-ramp happening. And now there's a lot of people who are not acknowledging that that is what is happening. We are starting to ramp back up. And so I've been looking at, okay, how many people out there in the media are pro Bill Gates, are pro WHO and how many people are coming out questioning that and the relationship that people have or the, the tolerance that people's intellect has around bringing complexity into the conversation. Because for me, again, it's not about this or that. It is, okay, okay you have an insight about the situation. Oh, this person also has their own insight and uh, interpretation. Oh, and this person and this person and this person. How tolerant are we of being able to receive new information and not go, well, it's either this or that, but it's, is it this and that and this and that? And can we not see the forest amongst all of the trees? Because I think that there is a, um, we're all looking for certainty. We're all looking for a way of looking at this situation. And I think as one of my teachers said, you need a loose hand around that rope going into a deep cave and you have to keep it loose, but keep it around the rope so that you can keep moving and keep taking in new information and have the personal space to actually be able to interpret it. Mm -hmm. So yes, I have been taking in and doing some research but more of what I'm left with as I was preparing to talk to you was how I need to be within myself as a, uh, a human so that I can actually uh, survive and, and stay hungry, stay thriving intellectually, emotionally, in the midst of so much discord, so much misinformation or, or so much um, uh, fact shaming that is going on. There's a lot of people trying, you know, it looks more like a roller derby out there than it does a round circle, uh, you know, study group. Mm. And I think that that's where we actually have to be is not coming to conclusions, but actually have that study group, have that round circle where people are feeling safe enough to question, to add complexity without the fear of being intellectually badgered by, by all of this information. Mm. And some of uh, one researcher that I know from Stanford University, he said that his, uh, his colleagues shamed him very quickly for coming out with stats that, that were saying that the death rate was lower than what was originally thought. And those people have recently come back to him apologizing, saying, we did that to, in a sense, because we were frightened that if the crowd was not afraid, then they wouldn't pull mm. back. They wouldn't do what the government asked them to do. Mm. So there we have to acknowledge that there is an emotional component here where they were trying to stir fear in us so that we would fall in line to do whatever they said, which mm. is logical. Mm. But if we don't look at that agenda, then we're not really seeing what was really going on. Mm. I know that you have your own circles and are in your own conversations. What, and what have you been finding? This week. Well, if you look on our Facebook page, I don't know if you've seen it yet, but I'm starting to post within the inside scoop the those little kernels that I'm picking off the streams. And, 
you know, of course, I probably have a very strong, what do they call it? A bias, like that uh, confirmation bias. <laughs> I, I'm noticing that anything that is horrible, <laughs> I tend to you know, gravitate towards quite quickly. So maybe that isn't the best, but I, I, I did notice that I had, there's about three or four uh, vids concerning the burning of 5G towers. And then they would get taken down very quickly. Like there was like 70 towers in England, like across the world right now, there's a possibility that, that you know, that people are very worried, upset, or do not want this 5G rollout, right? And, and what they, they don't want is for the rest of the world to realize, you know, what's going on because they may catch on and go, that's a very good idea. And, you know, I don't know how metal towers burn, and I don't know if it's kind of like a disinformation campaign, you know, but it's, it's kind of, there's another one. And again, you know, I kind of, I didn't really fact check, but it was about, they were in California, they were sending people around to test people for the virus. And if they tested positive, then they'd go to the FEMA camp for quarantine. <laughs> and you know, again, this is like worst case scenario to me. This is kind of like what I imagined, what, you know, then people are saying, you know, there's these FEMA camps all across North America and they've been empty. They're beside like the railway lines. And, <laughs> you know, you, you just can't comprehend that even though it has occurred in human history. But now because of the internet, there's so much, you know, information for or against this that, you know, before they would just kind of happen and maybe people weren't warned, but all of a sudden this camp was there and all of a sudden, you know, all the people in South Africa who are against the English are not. Um, there was another thing about China and how, you know, their social uh, interpretation score uh, is, is getting very sophisticated. They're linking it to artificial intelligence. And so every person is going to have some sort of score where you, you get access to the good stuff or you get denied from travel and, and the good stuff. So that to me, again, is another worst case scenario in terms of you know, the government having some sort of methodology of keeping the citizens in alignment and our basic freedoms just gone. Like, I mean, if, if we went to China and we, and we were being assessed like this, I don't think many of us would do that well. I mean, uh, and you know, this to me is like part of that battleground of freedom versus control and having the ability not just as an individual, but as larger groups to self-organize and protect ourselves, if in fact there is a design to put in this police surveillance state that seems to be at the background. It's not just the 5G rollout and getting fast internet. All of a sudden, every camera, everything on the planet is connected into different AIs. that are then socially assessing us, taking our temperature, seeing if we have a chip, seeing if we can go places. And this is something that, you know, again, will happen in stages. And it's, the biblical prophecies talk about, you know, this sort of chip. And uh, I was listening to uh, a preacher and he was going through, you know, all the steps kind of as we are uh, in a very succinct way. And again, coming in from a Christian biblical prophecy point of view. And, you know, I was really agreeing with him. You know, I, I mean, they're shutting down the churches. You, you, can, you can't meet you know, from a Christian point of view, you know, things couldn't kind of get worse in many ways. And their prophecies are all speaking about this. So there's this, you know, as they attempt to put this control measures in, there, there's so many people, you know, especially in the United States that are, 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 you know, probably on the brink of a civil war within a couple of years. If, you know, something happens with the elections and, um, there's such a wide divide between the Trump people who like him and dislike him. I, I just think that there's a, you know, the, the, there's a pressure, but that pressure is there as this cauldron to actually act as the, you know, the, the, the sort of tempest for people to spiritually evolve because now we have to choose. 
We have to choose why are you here? You know, truly, you know, are you here to support the people and all of us? Or are you here to get your piece of the pie? Or are you here to cower in the corner and do nothing? And so for me, you know, I, I'm starting to get the mega, I, I feel like this, this need to speak out more and to empower people and to create a new media network and to gather the planetary guardians and to go, you know, really take a stand. But it's also, there, I, I find that there's a, I like spitting into the ocean uh, at nighttime, uh, <laughs> that my words may not be having an effect. So, <laughs> one thing I've learned, and there's so much to say in response to what you just said, but the, the, the first thing is uh, I've come to feel that the amount of impact that a post, a comment has, is not reflected accurately by the amount of likes or the amount of responses I have. There's a whole lot more silent people watching. And um, due to the increasingly political, mm. embattled relationship that people have on social media, people are choosing to, to hold themselves back, and myself included. Um, you know, I silently research and I actually, it takes a lot for me to go, you know what, I'm engaging in this one. Mm. And so I think that, that, that's something just to hearten you that you may have more impact than you think. Uh, we don't necessarily know. Um, and I am, uh, I'm really seeing that this is a cauldron and in yoga they talk about how when there's pressure coming from the bottom and pressure coming from the top it meets in the middle and it meets around your solar plexus and they call the solar plexus or your third chakra the city of jewels because how is your inner jewels going to be made but through pressure and the pressure of the situation and how is our society dumbing us down it takes natural pressures away from us and promises because you have all of these conveniences you are fortunate you are fortunate because you don't have pressure you don't sweat you don't strain you don't flex all the muscles emotionally spiritually physically mentally and so because you, you don't have to think for yourself, we have all, all the experts for you. We have all of the conveniences for you. So you don't even really have to do anything except for what you're, spe you're specialized in. And then you're rewarded with whatever the machine has given you. And I see that that's stripped away. My favorite thing about this whole quarantine thing is that the food systems are breaking down. Uh, the, the factory farming is breaking down. And you have people just through the very um, logistics of it being forced to reconcile how they're going to feed themselves. The number one thing, you know, we have air, water, food. Those are our, our major things. So finally, we actually are at a place where we have to reconcile that. And so it's, it's a challenge, but everything is a challenge. And as one of my teachers says, the reward for work is more work. That is actually the reward because in that environment, you actually become a real human. We cease to become humans and we just live in a dream. You know, we live in a dream and so I'm very fortunate to, to be living in a time when I'm forced to learn. I've learned more plant identification so I can eat my lawn and eat the bushes around me in the past month than I have in three years. And so that's just one example of how we're really starting to wake up. And, um, and because I, I think that there's two things that are happening. We have to reconcile our own life 
and we need enough capacity to engage in the political, the, the, um, the research that's necessary to have a, a say in the bigger conversation. Mm -hmm. So we actually are spinning two plates as those Russian plate spinners are. Mm. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, again, in, in the duality of how we speak in the past, you know, you, you often bring up a lot from the from personal point of view and the health point of view, and I'm sort of coming from the larger geopolitical context, political point of view. And those two balancing acts are very difficult if you aren't sort of economically stable. Because if you're, if you're not, uh, if you haven't got that figured out, you know, you're always worrying or you're like anything else is sort of not that much of a concern because you've got to get food on the table and you've got to pay your rent and you've got to figure out what you're doing, right? And so the, the mind goes towards solving those problems and it's only the sort of the, the, either the philosophers or the people who, you know, I find a lot of uh, homeless people, but people that are outside the system who aren't trying to strive in the same way often are very philosophically strong. I mean, both Buddha and Jesus, they didn't seem to be into the mundane world and they had a lot of time to reflect and they had their own kind of, you know, their focus was on a spiritual path. So, you know, to me, the people that are actually doing the, I don't know if I say correct assessment, but the ones that are taking into account the larger spiritual picture of why we're here now, I, I think the Christians have a kind of a bad rap from anyone who's not a Christian. Because, um, you know, all the worldviews are sort of judging all the other worldviews as kind of insane. And they don't never they don't really say that, but I mean, if if we speak our beliefs and tell people truly what we think, <laughs> you know, a lot of times, you know, it, it's it's in the world of unbelievability, and you can be dismissed easily. And uh, one thing I've seen with all the media tracking I sort of have ever done is that any type of real spiritual approach to life is is really seen in an insane light. It's always sort of, it's, it's dismissed. And so the normal media has no real uh, appreciation or allowance for the spiritual side of things. And I think when you, when you go back in time and look at, let's say, the First Nations people who their whole life was based upon a connection to the earth and their spiritual practice, there was no distinction from it. And now we're in a time where it doesn't really exist. And, but there's a lot of people out there who that is the main focus of their life. And, and to me, those are the people that are questioning things in a deeper way, not just on the mundaneness of things, but on the spiritual side, they're seeking truth. And if you're seeking truth, at some point, you, you know, you're better at discerning truth from not truth. And kind of what you said about people arguing about credibility and arguing about you know they're in the they're in the the dark room and everyone's got a piece of the elephant and one guy's got the tail and and saying this is what an elephant is and another person's got the trunk and saying this is what an elephant is and someone else has the ear and saying this is what an elephant is and and, and that is a well-known story you know i think in, in a lot of spiritual traditions where people mistake their perspective to be the truth and they and and they they don't seem to be able to carry on an allowance for all the multiple perspectives as you said on what's occurring <laughs> so like someone came into my house so i was like huh ah <laughs> so um it, anyway i was i think i was getting to a point but maybe not i'll pass it back to you <laughs> Science, it has its religious aspects as well. And I think that it, it um, where people are, what I'm wondering if uh, you're appreciating is when people are putting things into context, they're trying to put things into context because there is, 
there is a fact, there is the collection of facts, there's the observation of facts, which are building blocks. And, and uh, then there is the context in which those facts are fit in. And I find that that's what I enjoy um, tracking within different groups of thinking is how are people putting these facts into context and are they actually uh, drawing overarching conclusions or have working hypothesis on what is happening. And some people never dare to actually go um, uh, to that point. You know, they never assume the authority of, okay, I'm going to actually look at these things in context and try to piece together a worldview, just a snapshot of what is the game that is being played at this time. Mm. And, um, and, and I think that that's a very important step. Um, and I want to say that, uh, again, I believe that it's important to be in the unknowing, but the wondering. I am wondering this. This is, I'm working this hypothesis. And theorists have working hypothesis that they don't own as true, but they could be working that for years and years and years. Mm. And so you have a working hypothesis. You, it's not seen as your conclusion. But with all the ADHD that goes on in our society right now, they want to go, oh, well, that's your working hypothesis. Well, I see that that's what you believe in. And it's like, no, I have not stated that this is the truth, but I am stating that this is the model that I am looking at. And if you want to spend time within this model, I can show you around the place mm -hmm. and let's see, um, you know, how your thoughts and feelings are, what are your impressions? So that again, it's, it, it's opening up the personal space that we have and that it's not, um, yeah, it's not badgered that uh, that space is actually allowed to um, have permission to run its course of inquiry, of questioning. Mm. And, I, and I think that that's really vital. You know, if we look back at the Greek cults of, uh, you know, cults, we, we think of as this like, oh, no thing. But, you know, in Greece, there were a lot of cults and they all had robust conversation and they all had you know they all had working hypothesis of what was happening but that was you know that was massaged and and uh and cultivated over time of questioning mm. and, and i think that that's very important and i think that we have to give ourselves time to do that if we want to actually realize our intellectual potential mm. and so that um, we can give ourselves time to be doing the, all these different natural human um, activities. And, yeah. Well, you know, I, I guess as you're saying that I'm thinking like, what does a cult have? And a cult sort of has a boundary. It has a philosophy. It has a way of life that all these people are agreed upon. And because of that, they can create community. And I'm thinking about, you know, you as an individual and that most of us these days are individuals. We're not really associating with a country. We're not really associating with a religion. We're not really associating with a group. We have a very individual, individualistic nature where we truly I think honor our freedom and want the freedom to explore, like you say, the, the freedom to try to figure it out on our own and not have some group mentality dictate to us how we're going to live our life. And I find that most of the people I think I'm attracted to share that, but that has a limitation because those individuals can never group together that well into larger sort of groups or coalitions to address some of these larger issues because we're alone. And so, you know, for me, I put forth you know, the idea of planetary guardians and as a, a media kind of game or collective where people of like mind who want to sort of transform the world's economic system from fear to love, start to work together. 
and start to work together on media teams first and then superhero teams and then shared knowledge communities and then larger issue coalitions. And looking at, you know, you and I, you know, have participated to some degree within the salmon uh, fish farming issue in British Columbia. And you see that, you know, if you don't have numbers, if you don't have a large group of people really helping out who are concerned and understand the issue and are following it and are creating that pressure to create, you know, legislation to, to change the laws, because deep down, that's the real game in town. You know, what are the laws and how are they enforced? You can talk all you want about whatever you want, but the things are going to stay the way they are uh, based upon, you know, these agreements where force is used if you, if you don't honor those agreements. And I, I think what's happening now is that these governments are, you know, working with other organizations behind the scenes to create a more uh, controlled society. And all of those, the salmon and anything really related to the good of the earth, to me, will, will, will do worse because these same organizations and governments do not have the intelligence or wisdom or interest to do the best for the species and do the best for the ecosystem. I mean, it's, it continually shows itself that it's always focused on money and it's always focused on the money of those people who want to make more money. And it, you know, it just over and over and over and over and over again. And sometimes what I see with, like, again, with this pandemic and the conversations about, is it a pandemic or the stats or all of the details that people just keeps, they miss the point that there's a design behind the events, that these events are false flags to some degree, and they're leading us to a certain destination that is not good for us. And at some point you have to take a stand. At some point you have to say no, because we're all being led along a pathway where it may not be you, but it will probably be your children. And if it isn't your children, it's your grandchildren. Like they think in terms of hundreds of years, they think in terms of decades, these plans, you know, have been in, you know, probably for, you know, some of them since the 1800s. Maybe, you know, that they're generational and their families and their groups of people who maintain a kind of control and they work it through deception. They work it because they've got the money to buy everything. And then they create this narrative through their media systems around how they want the world to interpret what's occurring. And now because of the internet, we have enough research and we have enough people that are very courageous who stand up and point to what's going on. And one of them, I think, that is, is, is sort of out of the news is Julian Assange. And looking, here's this guy who showed the entire world of the scamming, the level of the scamming. And one man, you know, I'm sure he's got a tight group of people helping him, but one person took a stand and took a stand for truth. And now he's in, in, in prison, I think probably being tortured and being, you know, and the whole world is sitting there doing nothing. You know, he's, he's a true hero. And that there should be millions of people every day, you know, just pounding whoever's holding him until he's out. He's a Luke Skywalker, you know. He's somebody who, when he dies, the whole world will, will, will mourn and everyone will say what a great guy he was. But now that he's in jail and now that he's, you know, sort of in their grasps, we, we have no power. And I think that's the problem right now is that the humans are not pissed off enough. You know, they're not pissed off enough at seeing the true designs of what is happening and then taking appropriate action. Because I remember some South American country, they came in and they, 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 were, they raised the water rights. They, some corporation had bought some water and the fricking country went fricking nuts. And that changed because they crossed a line that was way too much and everyone said, screw you. And they would have just completely torn the country apart unless they got the water back to where it was. And I don't advocate violence at all, 
uh, Gandhi seemed to have it down pat in terms of nonviolent um, protesting of just, uh, you know, I think every human being right now is being called to take a stand, whether they know it or not. And uh, yeah, the lifestyle that we and the situation that we've been born into that we don't, we don't fully have a choice except for how much we want to engage in it. And, and I think that that's very critical on a soul level. We actually have to come into acceptance of it because I see a lot of people that I work with, they're half in and half out. They are, they're overwhelmed by the very fact that they were born into a war zone. And we are, we're born into a very quiet war zone and the moves are not front lines coming together, but those militaristic moves that have massive end games in, in sight, you know, they talk about what is the end game. And yes, we can dither and argue about, you know, the facts, the stats, all of this. But I think you, you are very right in saying, keep your eye on the end game. What is this situation going to give the people that want power more power? How is that going to be? Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and because there's so much to pay attention to in this world that I think a rapid way to at least gain some footing, some perspective is what is the end game for, 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 for each of these. You know, we talk about the 5G rollout. We talk about how these companies are talking and these governments, all these governments are talking very openly about the internet of things, how everything. And now if the internet of, of things includes us, that really doesn't have, uh, you know, that is what is being proposed. You know, they are talking about chipping. And e even if that is wrapped in public health, which is, seems to be the greatest vector for acceptance is mm. public health, mm. then, but it's still, that is happening. So, so, so that's another end game. We're talking about GMO patents. You know, there's a lot of talk about Bill Gates and, you know, is he ethical? Is he not? Look at the work that he's doing in GMOs, picking up where Monsanto and DuPont left off. These are poison cartels. They were involved in World War II. These are, we have to soften our eyes a bit and start just looking. Okay, if this person is associating with these actions of actually holding patents on seeds, is this not an end game that is seen within the realm of Dr. Evil, you know? Mm -hmm. And so the, the internet of things, the patenting of, of uh, seeds of all of life, you know, if that is not enough, and that's just scratching the surface of, of some of the end game that is, is coming into place here. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's very easy then to start to use your intuitive knowledge. And I'm not saying use your hunch over your intellect, mm. but I'm saying put your intellect in context with the intuitive, putting all the pieces together and actually then motivating your personal action. Because you can't have political action without personal action, lifestyle. Mm. You know, as I... Um, as my fiance said, you know, demand a change, but change the demand. You have to do both at the same time to actually have a big change. And also just to, to be able to sustain your life. I see so many environmentalists burning themselves out mm. because they don't have the personal lifestyle that actually sustains them and fills them with joy. And we started this conversation with, you know, how do we re-inspire our spirit to keep on going, to take the edge off? Mm. And I think that that's really important because we're in this for the rest of our life. And that's something that every side of this conversation is saying, 
we're never going back to normal. Mm. There's PC and there's PC, pre-COVID and post-COVID. <laughs> and we have, we finally have stepped over a line where, it, you know, it's never going to be the same. Mm. And I think that we have to prepare ourselves and curate a lifestyle that can actually have us staying in the game. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Well, you, you, you I remember asking you a question and I said, how could you be so loving? How could you maintain the type of uh, connection I I see you have with people? And and you said something that I actually, I had never heard before, but made so much sense. And it was just, you keep your daily practice. And it, it hit home to me because, you know, whatever is, let's say someone's spiritual life in some manner, they, you know, you have a daily practice and it, you know, it's supposed to be, I guess, there all the time, present moment awareness, God realization, whatever you want. But deep down, you know, we forget and we get unconscious and we sort of go back into the habits of body and mind. And to maintain whatever is your prayers or your meditation or whatever it is, is your daily practice, because I know you, you have many things you do. And I would just say, I guess, to the viewing audience where you know, that that balance point between your daily practice and then adding in a bit of a daily practice. And for some, it may be just scrolling on Facebook and and watching YouTube videos. But to, you know, I I think be your own media and be your own media for your circle of influence. And like you said to me earlier, where, you know, I can feel a little frustrated thinking that I'm not really doing anything. I'm not reaching anything because, uh, if you're to me a long time conspiracy theorist, you, you sort of have a bubble around you where people, they don't, you know, you, you, you can have friends and you have a lot of people that maybe respect you for what you're doing, but nobody wants to socially distance themselves too much. And I found that I had a teacher who was, let's say, a conspiracy theorist, and I just saw that, I mean, he had lost everybody. And for me to be around him was sometimes too much because the information he was presenting to me was so strong, so continual, and again, pointed to what's happening now. And he was talking about it, you know, 20, 30 years ago. And uh, and I saw that I went through this, this um, steps of believability, steps of what I was willing to bring into my life, steps of what I was willing to share. And a lot of that was determined by how much fear I had on how other people would interpret me or how, you know, just knowing that the effect that he has on me, I'm going to have that effect on people. And, you know, we were social beings and to be isolated with this type of information is very (laughs) emotionally depressing because you're, you're seeing this massive problem, you're trying to tell people about it, and everyone is either not listening or they're just missing you to the point where you get kind of alone. And then you just kind of put up your walls and, and then you, 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 you get stronger because you, you, you have a sense that you are seeing the truth and that it isn't the masses that see the truth. It isn't the group that sees the truth. It's usually the black sheep. It's the one person in the room who's willing to, to point at something and say, you know, I'm not going along with the group thing. And I want to bring attention to this because I think it's bad for the group and it's bad for, for everybody. But to go outside of that mindset and to enter into that, let's say, conspiracy mindset, now, you know, you're a target for the, the ones at the top and all their gatekeepers that don't want that type of information out there and don't want someone to bring that information to the rest of the group. And because you get attacked and you get, you know, your credibility goes and all your, you know, you you lose your life and and you can't do normal business and you can't be a normal person because people are afraid to be around you or your reputation, your reputation has been killed. And I think you're, you're those two doctors that the video that you put up, you know, it's down. And, you know, David Icke, you know, he's talking about, you know, so many of the things we're talking about to a, you know, much larger audience (laughs) and he's taken down. So the people that are actually starting to point the truth, if they hit the truth, 
boy, now you're going to be silenced. And so, you know, I think for every individual out there, they have to go through a process of understanding how committed they are to really stand out and stand up and to speak their truth to their community. And, and it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of like, I know that I have other people feeding me information that are far more vocal and, and, and I, I think far more intelligent, but they take the risk. They've already gone past the risk of losing their community. I pretty much lost my community, I think. I don't think I ever had a community, but I do know that now, <laughs> you know, I mean, at what point do you have to realize that something's going on that has some sort of devious design? You know, like, like I don't know about you with you, because I, I feel that you're more, a lot more diplomatic and, and you're, you're, you read people better and you're, um, you know, you bring a joy to groups. You're not coming in you know, with the hammer of how we're all going to die soon. You, you know, you, you're, you're making people feel good. So I, I wonder about you and, and your world and if you feel as if anything's changed in that way. It has changed. It really has changed. My life, though, personally, has maintained pretty much the same, you know, the same rituals. I have things that I do every day, as you mentioned, and um, I tinker with those and work those all the time. But I have come to feel the effect of those rituals. And so, um, and expect my life. I now want my life to be um, lived within the space of, of me doing the mental cleansings with my meditations. Do, you know, live in a vital body because I, I exercise so much. You know, actually be able to, to feel and transmit energy through my, my psychic breathing practices and all that. So that is there. Um, but what is happening is I'm maturing. And it's a very uncomfortable process. And I'm maturing my disagreement body, my ability to have a personal space and, and also a common heart space where I can meet people and disagree. Because the, my first reaction when someone disagrees with me, either on a post or in a conversation, is to either go nice and passive or to clam up, get mad, and peace out. So those are my two options. But that's not a very functional option. And I think a lot of the training, say, in the military, of you know, my friends in the military, are about resiliency. And in a sense, strengthening yourself so that you can stay present, you can stay in the game, even when it's not going your way, you're exhausted, you know, things are seeming bleak, and you're still in the game. Mm. And I think that that's what we're learning now, ideally, is the abilities to mm. relate to people without cutting them out. For a, for a difference of opinion, but without giving up our own opinion to get along with them. Mm. So we're actually, because pol politics has always been one of the major sticking points to human relations. Mm. And now is the time to evolve the political art form. And there are many arts within political life. And it's important for us to mature them. Absolutely critical. And that is not comfortable by the very nature of exercising all our capacities. We're going beyond our capacity, staying present and adapting. Adapting is, you know, it's my greatest joy is seeing how adaption occurs in real time. And this is us politically, socially adapting and uh, trying to manage all of our different states so that we can stay present clear-minded and open-hearted with people mm. and uh, we look at the problem with the left and the right and we and we just see in the states but also up here in canada we see how 
you know, the left pushes so far forward on the surface and then the right with their traditional values sticks back and then they find all these reasons to just create a schism and go didactic. It's this or that. Mm. But in fact, there is a lot of commonality and there's a lot that can be a massage. And that's why I stay so diplomatic is because I feel that people's initial reactions are rarely their truest reactions. Mm. Hmm. Well, I think we're coming to the end of our, our hour together. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm seeing that we were less focused on the outside news and more focused just on our own sort of internal world and how we deal with it and trying to give some feedback, I guess, to other people who may be going through the same thing and to, I guess, you know, again, it's the balance of regular life with dealing with the regular life at, in a much larger scale that's going to affect us all if we don't deal with it. I don't think it's a time for the ostrich to keep the head in the sand. And so do you have any parting comments for our growing audience uh, mm. regarding anything? As a lifestyle advice, first of all, I would say that maintain your structures, maintain your rituals and put them in your phone. Or uh, if you don't have a phone, write them down in your calendar that uh, when something is not written down and we are not held accountable to show up, we will easily push it to the next day, push it to the next week. And I think that that is vitally important. Why? Because why, why do soldiers train? They train so that they are strong and resilient and capable of staying in the game even when there's pressure. Yeah. We are now looking at rolling out and going, we are going on the off ramp of this quarantine. If people like it or not, that is what is happening. So how can we now take the responsibility to strengthen ourselves, strengthen ourselves and open up to all of the different camps and what they have to offer and look, are there natural remedies that will strengthen your immune system, help with viral load, and keep you strong enough that if you do contract this virus, that you're going to be okay with it? Mm. And I think that that's important. Are you going to be a survivor? Because no one else is looking out for you. And that's what we learned mm. through fighting the salmon, is that our government do doesn't have every corner of our back covered. Mm. and so it's our responsibility to be the adult mm. well thank you mr yogi shambu uh very wise words and uh i have greatly enjoyed our little chat as i do each week and uh goodbye to all the people out there and if there are any planetary guardians who have heard this and hear the call contact us because we are starting to self-organize and we are looking for people that are interested in assisting mother earth to maintain a large field of love for us all go mother earth yes you are thank you captain sweet soon <laughs>